Okay, so this month we are going to talk about managing your headers with a include what you use. And this is going to be kind of a part experience report, part introduction to the library. So include what you use. What is it? Well, this is their GitHub site. It is a tool to help you identify two problems that are common with header files in C++. The first problem is you included a header but you're not actually using anything from that header. And this may be because the, you know, you thought a symbol was coming from a certain header and it wasn't so you just included the wrong one and um, it, it turned out due to other reasons you were you were including the correct one either directly or indirectly and so you didn't notice that the header was not supplying any declarations that you needed the and that that can happen maybe just because you included the wrong header and it, it you didn't notice or as you edit the file over time the original reason for including that header disappears you're no longer using any of the declarations that are provided by that header. And so now the header is, is, while it was needed originally, now it's redundant. And the other problem, and this is the one that's more pernicious, is um, your file compiles, but you did not include the headers for all the declarations of all the symbols that you are actually using. And you might ask yourself, how can that be? And the answer is that header file inclusion is transitive. So you include a header that includes another header that includes another header. And through that chain of inclusions, you get the declaration for the symbol that you are actually using without directly including the header for it. And the reason this is a... Uh, somewhat sticky problem is because eventually what can happen is the uh, intermediate header may change suppose it's an application header and so you've edited that header that you are including and now it's no longer including that it's no longer including the header that you rely on and now your code doesn't compile anymore because now you don't have a declaration for the symbols that you're u all of the symbols that you're using. And another sticky problem that can happen is sometimes you get a header included as a side effect of the implementation of the standard library or somebody else's library, some third party library that was including standard headers it's obviously a third-party library. It's not going to be including your application headers, but they will often include standard library headers. And then that third-party library changes. They're no longer including the same set of standard library headers. And now stuff from the standard library that you were using is not declared anymore, and you get a compilation error. So the idea behind include what you use is every symbol that you are not defining in every source file so that is a symbol that you reference you are a consumer of that symbol but you are not the provider you're not defining it you are consuming it you need a declaration for those symbols and any source file that references a symbol that is that it is not defining should be including a header file that declares that symbol directly so that seems like a fairly straightforward proposition, but it turns out that it can get difficult in answering that question of should you include a header or not? Suppose you have a container that you've written in your own header file and your container is an alias for standard vector of standard string. And your header your header that's declaring this container maybe it's a, uh, a, a using alias or maybe it's a typedef 
or maybe it's a struct that inherits from a standard library implementation or it holds a standard library implementation as a mem data member. Your application container header included the necessary standard library headers for like vector and string. And that means that due to the transitive nature of includes, anybody that included the header for your application container also got the vector and string included, but they weren't using vector and string directly. They were using your container. The fact that your container is implemented as a vector of string is an implementation detail of your container. And due to the nature of includes, that uh, implementation detail has kind of leaked out. And now anybody that's including your application specific container as a side effect gets an inclusion of vector and string. Now suppose you change your implementation of your container. It's no longer a vector of string. You realized like I only needed a fixed number of elements. So you changed your implementation to std array of string. Now anybody that was relying on vector coming through as a side effect of your application specific container header will break. They were using vector. They included your application container header. They got vector as a side effect. They were using vector though and they didn't directly include vector and now you've changed the implementation of your application specific header and those source files break. So this is a barrier to refactoring because of the uh, transitive nature of includes creates this problem. So now the question is, uh, if you include that header for that application specific container, are you really in di directly using string, std string? Are you directly using std vector? Or is that an implementation detail of the container? And it depends on the interface of the container and you know, is the container just a type def? In which case, yes, you really are using vector and string, but it's somewhat hidden behind, you know, another name, so on. So answering this question of what symbols do you actually use can get quite sticky in the face of type defs and type aliases and so on. So uh, include what you use is implemented using the libraries that come as part of Clang. Now these are uh, libraries that Clang uses to parse your C++ files and parse preprocessor macros and everything else in order to build an abstract syntax tree of your C++ source code. So include what you use builds an AST of your source code, traverses that AST to look for references to symbols that are not defined by a source file and tries to figure out where those symbols are declared, tries to figure out what is the appropriate header to include in order to get those declarations. We'll talk about the subtlety there in just a moment. Then looks at the list of includes that are present in your source file and tries to determine if you are missing an include for a symbol that you're using or if you have includes in your source file that don't provide any declarations for all this for the set of symbols that you are using so either a redundant include or a missing include uh, this tool was originally created at Google uh, and it has some Google, you know, incorporated assumptions built into it, which we will get to in a second. Now, <coughs> excuse me, I mentioned there's a subtle difference between the header file that provides a declaration and the header file that you should include. And the reason that these two things are not necessarily the same is because implementers of the standard library factor out implementation details into various headers that are internal to the implementation of the library. You're not supposed to include those headers directly. You're supposed to include the public header. 
And sometimes this is obvious because, you know, the, the implementation header is in a direct a subdirectory called private. So it's kind of obvious you shouldn't be including that for just looking at the path of the header file name. Other times it's not so obvious. The C++ standard library string class is provided, has to be, according to the standard, has to be provided by including the word string in angle brackets. And the implementation is not even required to have a file called string. Uh, what, the, what the implementation does is it behaves as if there was a file called string that provided the definitions, declarations, etc. In practice, everybody does implement it as a file called string with no extension. But on Windows, the file called string, uh, shortly after the file starts, it includes a file called xString which is an implementation detail. So you're not supposed to include X string. You're supposed to include string. And um, other libraries have other uh, differences between public and private headers. The public headers that are supposed to be provided, according there are a, a list of them according to the standard, but a third party library may again have some kind of separation between public and private headers and there it may tell you that you're supposed to include the public ones and not the private ones you'll often see in boost libraries a subdirectory called detail that contains private headers that are implementation details you're not supposed to include those directly you're supposed to include the public headers that are uh, side by side with the detail directory uh, so answering these questions is not trivial which is why they use the Clang front-end parser and AST machinery in order to try and answer these questions. And they still have a tough time managing edge cases, particularly when it comes to template classes and template libraries, um, because uh, if you have a template class and you don't call a member of that template class, then there may be symbols that you're not referencing directly, even though they are part of the template declaration, they don't end up being part of the template instantiation because you didn't call those methods. Uh, so that can change the set of visible symbols. Okay, so include what you use. It is based on Clang. And uh, let's make this a little bigger. So um, in this little table here, you can see there's the include what you use version, the Clang version, and then there's the branch of the include what you use code. Now, because include what you use uses the internal uh, libraries of Clang itself. They're not internal in the sense that they're like secret sauce, but they are internal in the sense that when you install a Clang package of executables like the compiler and um, Clang tidy and various tools like that, you won't get those internal libraries as part of that package. They're, uh, they have a public interface that's documented, but they're not shipped as part of the installed packages when you get the Clang executables. So you have two choices. You can build it yourself, in which case you want to use the appropriate version of the Clang source code for the appropriate corresponding version of include what you use, as given by this table here. And they say that their intention is that the head of current development on Clang, which is the main uh, branch, should match the head of this tool, um, the master branch. And you might ask yourself, well, how often do they update this tool? Well, the 0 0.22 release was created two, two days ago. So this is a tool that's actively maintained. Um, now, if you are on a Ubuntu operating system, Ubuntu packages these internal developer libraries uh, makes and makes them available so that you can get them from the Ubuntu packaging system. Unfortunately, there's no such published package for Windows. There is published packages for the binary tools like Clang and <coughs> Clang Tidy and so on, but not for these internal development libraries. So, if you're on Windows and you want to run this tool, it means you have to build Clang. 
Now, to do that, uh, they have explanations here of how to um, plug your code into um, the CMake-based build of Clang. And you, uh, let's see. It, uh, oh, how to build as part of LLVM. This is how you do it. <clears throat> so LLVM, because LLVM was created as a research project to act as a framework for people to add extra things onto it using their libraries as a base, they have a kind of extension mechanism in their CMake base build <clears throat> where you <clears throat> define this variable LLVM enable projects to say the set of stuff from Clang that you want built, in which case we want Clang, so you don't necessarily care about um, other parts like Clang tidy and so on. And then you can glue in an external project. In this case, it's IWYU, which is include what you use. And then you supply another variable that gives the path to the source directory for the external project. So, <coughs> You can do all that on Windows, and you can build this whole big pile of stuff. It takes a really long time because the Clang code base is non-trivial, and a trick to speeding things up is to define another variable for Clang when you build the Clang tree that says to limit the target backends to just x86. Otherwise, it will create backends for uh, Risk five CPU and for MIPS CPU and for ARM CPUs and so on for all the different backends that are currently active on Clang. So if you just target the only the x86 backend, which also includes x64 64-bit instructions, but that's basically the Intel CPU architecture that will speed things up considerably. And if you just say uh, ex enable projects Clang, then you don't get all the other stuff built like that you don't need, like Clang Tidy and Clang Rename and Clang D and but whatever other tools that are part of the Clang tree. However, it still takes a very long time to build. Um, I don't know what the uh, the Git continuous in it, GitHub continuous integration timeout value is for a job but you know build, building all of this stuff might push it up against the limit and might get your job canceled because it took too long but at any rate we're going to find out that even if you do build it there's still some significant hurdles so um, when I attempted to do this because my primary development environment that I use is Windows so I don't have pre-built dev packages when I tried to build main of clang against master of include what you use I got some errors that were the typical oh it's unfortunate but due to historical evolution of Windows the Windows header files will define things like void in all caps to uh, you know be a macro that expands to the void keyword if you can imagine back in the time when there were functions that could, you know, early com C compilers didn't implement the void return type. So that's a really long time ago, but it's, you, you can't, can't remove it because it will still break things. People are still using that macro. However, there was some enum inside Clang that had void in all caps as one of the enum members so it, it created this conflict not because of clang clang built fine but include what you use included some headers that transitively ironically it's a transitive header inclusion problem they ended up transitively including a windows header that defined void as a macro and then this enum failed to compile because now the member of the enum is no longer an identifier it's the void keyword in lowercase instead of the identifier in uppercase so master against main didn't work main worked fine on clang uh, they have continuous integration uh, testing on windows so they're gonna know really quick if they've broken windows on main but the problem is that 
master of includes what you use, includes its own headers, and then it includes headers from Clang. And along the way, some Windows headers got included, and so it broke. So I had to back off to the Clang 18 branch and the uh, release slash 18.0 branch of Clang and the Clang 18 branch of include what you use to get it to compile. So that was the first hurdle. Lots of compiling later, I finally got something built. And the way include what you use works, it really needs to be able to find the header files that come with Clang. Now, you might say to yourself, I thought header files were the implementation of the standard library. Why? What do they have to do with Clang? And the answer is that some of the headers in the standard library come from things like vector and string and stuff like that and are completely, you know, they're not completely decoupled from the compiler, but they're not tightly coupled to the compiler. Other headers are providing details from the compiler. Uh, and, you know, for instance, the type, what is the type of long? You know, is that a 32-bit quantity? Or is it a 64-bit quantity? Is it a 128-bit quantity? You know, all the standard says is that long has to be at least as big as an int, and an int has to be at least as big as a short, and a short has to be at least as big as a care. It doesn't say that a short has to be bigger than a care. It doesn't say that an int has to be bigger than a short. It doesn't say that a long has to be bigger than an int. And it doesn't say that a long long has to be bigger than a long. So, there are certain headers that are specific to the compiler. And include what you use has to be able to locate those that are specific to Clang so that its AST machinery and all the other inferencing mechanisms that it has are going to work correctly. So that's um, why when they tell you to build include what you use as part of Clang, they tell you to enable the Clang project as part of the build. And in order to get everything to work correctly, you have to make an install image so in uh, CMake terms, that's building the install target. The install target, by default, will want to like write to C program files LLVM. That's obviously not the right place. You want to write to a temporary place in your build directory. So you have to give it another install prefix in order to get the install image created correctly. And then once you do that, then you've got something that you can run. However, we're not done because we have to glue this into our build somehow. So that's just the building part of building include what you use. And again, if you're on a uh, an Ubuntu distribution, you may be able to just get a pre-built include what you use straight from the packaging system, the system packager, you know, apt-get or apk or what have you. And that's how you would get the tool on an Ubuntu system. And then the next thing you need to know is how can I run this tool against my source files? Well, you can certainly just supply a source file on the command line to include what you use. And it will run and analyze that file. The problem is that it doesn't have all the necessary compilation flags and include search paths and it doesn't know where your standard library is coming from and so on. So <coughs> really what you want to do and this was how include what you use was intended to be run, is you want to run it as part of your build. Now when include what you use was originally written, it was meant to be a replacement for your C++ compiler so that when your make file was invoking the C++ compiler, it was really invoking include what you use with all the same command line arguments that it would have passed to the compiler and then include what you use would have a complete picture of how this source file was supposed to be compiled you know which macros are defined which macros are undefined which include search directories to look in and so on now um, as time went on 
they added support for using the compile commands database. So compile commands.json is uh, can be exported by certain generators in CMake, namely uh, Unix make files and Ninja. And using that compilation database, which is basically just a record of all the command line arguments that are used to compile each source file. It can process that JSON database and then uh, examine every file that's mentioned, every source file that's mentioned in the compilation database and then process them that way. So that's this uh, example here is they run CMake to generate the compile underscore commands.json file and then they run this Python script and they point this dash p argument points to the compilation database that was generated by the CMake generator. So that's important to understand. The, it's the generator that creates that file, not CMake itself. <coughs> C, you can just think of CMake as a framework to set a bunch of variables and invoke a generator to generate your build script. Uh, so uh, that's one way to do it. And then a uh, further way to do it, a further way to invoke, include what you use, is using a built-in a built-in variable inside CMake itself that's been there since CMake 3.3. And the idea here is you specify using uh, the where lang here it can be either c or cxx for c++ you define this variable to the path to the include what you use executable and then when the generator creates your build script for every source file that it compiles it will compile it first and then it will run the include what you use tool specified by this variable on the source file that it just compiled. So if the file doesn't compile, it doesn't run include what you use. But if the file compiles successfully, it will then run include what you use, and include what you use can be configured to report errors that it finds as a compilation error. So then if you accidentally introduce one of these mistakes, then your build will fail and you'll get notified right away as you make changes and build your code that you've introduced this sort of problem. Now, that's all fine and dandy, but how well does it work in practice? Well, uh, over here, I've, this is a Windows command prompt, and I built uh, include what you use locally and I managed to get it to run but you can see that it's a lot of false positives here so it's telling me to get the var args macros va start and va end I should include double underscore stood arg underscore va underscore arg dot h uh, no that's wrong I should not be doing that and it's telling me to get standard out, I should be including core CRT underscore W standard IO dot H. No, that's wrong. I should be including either standard IO dot H or I should be including C standard IO, which it correctly flagged it down here as the thing I should include for printf and fprintf and so on. But as I mentioned earlier, it's telling me to include X string, which is an internal implementation header for string. That's wrong. That That's not what I should be including. This is not a public header. Um, so, it's reporting a bunch of false positives here. Now, all of this stuff is heuristic based. It, you, you, there's no way to programmatically know that x string is a private header and instead I should be including string. It has to be, somebody has to build a mapping of um, these things are private headers and the and the corresponding public header is this one over here you know and again like vc runtime underscore string dot h that that's not the thing to include that should be including 
string.h to get these string functions. String.h is the public header, or C string is the C++ version of the C standard header string.h. Now, you're supposed to be able to supply a mapping file so that you can correct these problems. On Windows, even when I supplied the mapping file, I was not able to get it to uh, recognize it correctly. It could, I, I can't tell if it's user error or if it, if it just doesn't work or what have you. I, I basically I ran out of time in preparing for this presentation. So um, this is kind of telling me that argument is, is, get, is not getting passed to include what you use. It's going straight to the compiler. Uh, but over in their GitHub project, they do have continuous integration builds, but they only run on Ubuntu. So they never do any continuous integration testing on Windows, and their mappings that they've built up to map private headers to the corresponding public headers are all GCC specific, and they haven't built up any mappings for MSVC because it's a Google project, and Google doesn't, Google as a company, just frankly doesn't care about Windows. So these are extra hurdles for a Windows user. And you think like, okay, well, that's fine. I, I know what I'll do. I'll just go over to um, Windows subsystem for Linux. WSL. And that's uh, an Ubuntu distribution in there. And then I can just go along and do it the Ubuntu way. Except over here, the problem that I ran into is whenever I would run the tool, it would always be scanning the GCC header files and having a hard time. It can't find std def.h. std def.h is something that comes, you know, from the likely comes from the compiler more than from the standard standard library implementer. Um, you know, this is where things like uint 8t and stuff like that are defined. So I could not get it to work under the Clang integration support. Uh, sorry, the CMake integration support on Ubuntu. And this is uh, on Ubuntu. I used apt-get to get include what you use instead of, you know, building it myself. But I couldn't really get any farther. Um, and so that was also a bust. So uh, the last way that I knew of to try and run this tool is through a GitHub action. So uh, this guy, Emil Geta, I'm assuming is his, is his name, that's his uh, GitHub account, has created a GitHub action that runs include what you use inside a Docker image against your source code having been given a compilation database path. And I thought, okay, um, instead of working a, 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 another thing that I thought might have been interfering with my attempts to use it on a significant code basis, my significant code bases use VC package to manage third party dependencies. And VC package does that by gluing itself in as a toolchain file. And I thought perhaps that toolchain file mechanism was interfering with include what you use as ability to get run instead of the compiler and so on. So um, I decided instead to create a simple example repository from scratch, which I've done over here. If we just look at this code, it's really dumb. There's just a main file that includes a header. It uses some uh, symbols and the header includes some other headers and def and uh, defines a function. The function is implemented over here in this uh, source file corresponding to the header. And I thought, all right, I'll just get this set up as a GitHub uh, workflow running include what you use. And um, so I added that. We'll take a look at the, the results of these workflow runs. 
um, here, my initial problem was that apparently Ninja is not installed on the Ubuntu runner by default. Uh, you can you can add commands into your workflow to get Ninja installed. So I was like, okay, it, it, it didn't have Ninja, so we'll switch to Unix make files because this action requires a compilation database. So I need to use a CMake generator that can generate the compilation database and there's only two and that's Unix make files and Ninja well it didn't have Ninja so we'll switch to a Unix make file so after we do that then this basic includes what you use uh, workflow is running now all I'm doing is running CMake to generate the compilation database I am not actually running include what you use yet in this in this version of the workflow but I just you know start simple and add things one step at a time don't try to do everything all at once because then when it fails you, you might not be sure which part of it is actually causing the failure so number three I got to a green and then I added my include what you use action in here and then I had uh, difficulty. It said, oh, when you reference, let's take a look at the workflow file so we can have this up while we talk about this. So here's my workflow file defined as a YAML file. And when you use somebody else's actions, you specify the, git, the name of the GitHub user that has the action and then the action name that ends up being the repository name containing the action and then this uh, version tag here identifies which git commit to use for uh, running the action in your workflow now uh, I'm using symbolic version numbers here so those end up being either branch names or tag names in git and that corresponds to a specific git hash for a specific commit if you want to be a uh, hundred percent certain that you're getting the compatible action you should use the hash instead of the symbolic name and the reason for that is because they can change the symbolic name to point to a different hash and now you're running a different version of the action without really realizing it but this uh, include what you use action down here if we look at my run that failed you see it says username name of the action include what you use action at v1 why did I say at v1 because that's what his documentation says but in reality if we go look at his repository we see that tag is v1.0 not v1 so I have to file a github issue against or maybe I'll do a pull request and just fix his readme but his readme is wrong his readme says use v1 which is what I did and then that failed because there's no symbolic name v1 pointing to a git commit in a repository because it's v1.0 not v1 so one more stumbling block here we are at run number four so um, tweak the version number in run number five now we get the right we get the action and it runs it and it says no compilation database found now let's go over here into Visual Studio really quick and I will show you my presets so uh, me personally my taste I don't like my build directory inside my source directory so I usually make my build directory to be a sibling of my source directory that means here's my source directory and here's my build directory so they're siblings there is no 
build products whatsoever inside my source tree. So I never have to git ignore my build directory or anything like that. And that's what I did over here. Here's my source directory. I went up one level to my build directory where my compilation database was generated. And then his action says, oh, there's no compile commands.json in there. And here's the compilation path. And I'm like, well, that's funny. Let's double, let's double check that it's really there. So over here on run number six of the workflow. All right, all right, let's maybe, maybe that tool is correct. Let's, let's just see if it's really there. Is there a compile commands.json in dot dot slash build dash include what you use? This is the name of my little CMake preset. And uh, Bash says, yes, there is. Bash exited with code zero. And there it is. There's the output. Yep. So, however this action is implemented, it requires that your compilation database be in some subdirectory of your source directory. It can't be outside. Okay, another undocumented problem that we found out about. So just switch things so that for this particular workflow, we're going to create the build directory as a subdirectory of my source directory. It's not my personal preference, but this isn't hanging out on my machine. It's just hanging out on the GitHub runner. Now we see again that the compile commands JSON is where we expect it. And then include what you use, ran, didn't report any problems, because I haven't artificially introduced problems into the code yet at this point. Uh, it ran successfully. So okay, w again, one step at a time, get things working one step at a time. So, uh, add the child builder that worked, and then we uh, modified our source code to add some includes that aren't used. And sure enough, we get a report saying when it when include what you use says you should add these lines to this source file. It's saying to the best of its knowledge, you referenced symbols that you did not directly include the headers for. So when it tells you to add lines, that means you are missing headers for things that you referenced. When it tells you to remove lines, it's saying for these headers that you included, it couldn't determine that any symbol provided by those headers was referenced, so they can be removed. Now, you notice that the uh, workflow job is green even though it detected problems and we'll see how to rectify that in just a moment so that was the case for unused includes what about uh, transitive includes where you are getting things accidentally through the transitive nature of a file inclusion so uh, if we take a look at code uh, let's go back over here to Visual Studio I'll show you so I uh, change things around so that I'm including this transitive header. This transitive header is uh, including a bunch of things from the standard library. It included string, which it needed for this function that is declared here. And the function is implemented in this other source file. So I am getting string included transitively but I am using string directly so I should be including string directly for my use of std string and I am using standard C out so I should be including IO stream for my direct use of standard C out so if we go back over here and look at what include what you use said it said I should include IO stream. Now, again, uh, it's a bit funny. It said that uh, I think actually this version of the code 
is not the exact version that we are looking at. Oh, actions check out. This should give the hash, right? I think this is the hash. If we look at it, so that is uh, E3EA. Look at code. Look at commit history. And we want E3EA. That's this one. And you see in my, let's just do browse at this hash. And my main.cpp is including transitive.h, and transitive.h is including fstream and iostream. So these, in, in this version of the file, I'm not using that function yet. So fstream here is redundant. iostream here in this transitive.h is redundant. But over in my main.cpp, I should be including iostream for this usage here. And that is what, uh, let's get back to the actions. And that is what include what use is telling us. It is telling us don't include transitive.h from main.cpp because it didn't provide any declarations for that we were directly using. But in main, we should be including iostream because we are directly using it. And the little comment here is telling us the stuff that we're getting from there. The stream insertion operators, standard C out, and O stream. Okay, now, that's all good and dandy, but what you really want is you want this workflow to fail this job, this include what you use job, when you have one of these violations. Once you get your code base clean of violations, then you want to keep it clean. So you want this code base to fail if you have a violation. And that's what I've done here is I've changed the workflow so that uh, we see the output from include what you use. And then the result of that step is considered a failure. And we did that by, if we take a look at the workflow definition, let's make this bigger. What we changed was we changed no error to false. No error true being when include what you use violations are found, they do not report as an error. Uh, personally, I'm not a fan of Boolean values that are configured as opposites. In other words, I don't want to see a bool that says don't print. What I want to see is a bool that says print. So I, I'm not a fan of specifying Boolean conditions in the negative. Um, so this, I, I didn't write this action, so pff, you know, take it as it is. Uh, and there's my uh, updated compilation database path as a child directory of my source directory. So what's the takeaway from all of this? Well, if you have a GitHub project uh, and you can use this uh, GitHub action, you know, not too difficult to set up and get configured correctly. I had a devil of a time trying to get it to work on either WSL or uh, Windows. It, and the additional burden of having to build everything yourself on Windows is, is a, a big hurdle for most people. Having done Clang Tidy development myself, it wasn't a big burden for me, but for your average person that isn't familiar with all that stuff, that's, that's a big ask. So I would say this tool is useful, but it has usability problems. Uh, namely, like certainly for a Windows user, I couldn't get it to run in any meaningful way. And, and again, maybe that some of that was user error. Um, it doesn't help that all their examples are really, uh, you know, Unix or Ubuntu based. And so there's no uh, end, end example of, you know, how to do everything on Windows. I mean, they have some simple build instructions and stuff, but I, I, I couldn't, following their direct recipe, I couldn't get it to work. Um, well, I, I couldn't get it to work in a way that was useful so that I could, you know, start weeding out the false positives. I didn't want to have to litter my code with tons of lint comments. 
that is one way that you can uh, go to here to include what you use.org, which is kind of their just little front site instructions for users way down here you know how to correct mistakes well there, there's uh, this is you can modify your code uh, to you know obviously do what include what you suggests but since it has false positives you can start sprinkling you know these pragma comments around your code to correct the false positives but there's so many false positives on Windows because they don't have the mappings set up to identify private header files in the Windows standard library implementation on the Windows compiler to map those to the corresponding public header that you should be including so it you know it, it just would be a big amount of editing that you'd have to do and it, there'd be so much editing that it probably wouldn't be worth it so if you have cross-platform code and you can run it on a on Ubuntu inside that docker container using a this github action that's at least something uh, unfortunately this github action is four years old and it's um, tied to I believe LLVM 9 and LLVM is currently on version 18 so it's pretty laggy uh, and it's also a stale version of include what you use it's what's cooked into his docker image which he made you know four or five years ago uh, you know initial release on March 11th 2020 so um, better than nothing if you can use it via the github action but if your windows only or if your code is not hosted on github because it's closed source then you know whew, bit bit of a bit of a tall ask to try and get this integrated in now again uh, certainly open to some of this being user error on my part this is the first time I ever tried to use this tool and it was a significant delay as I tried to get everything built just so I could start to play with it um, you know certainly some flailing around there on my part but uh, I, I would say if, if you can get this tool running in your environment either because your code is already hosted on github and has a Ubuntu runner build so you know your code is compiling clean on Ubuntu without errors um, then you know give it a try see what it suggests you know maybe leave it so that the action is not failing and just issuing the report and consult the report and you know fix things as you go and if you get all the way down to a clean report then you can turn it on to failing uh, for Windows uh, just don't think it's ready for prime time yet on a on a for a Windows developer and there's multiple barriers there not all of which are laying at the feet of include what you use for instance the lack of pre-built binaries for the LLVM and Clang development packages um, and you know asking somebody to build all that stuff from scratch is you know that's a big ask um, there might be a way to start providing that via um, like a, a VC package binary cache or something um, who knows uh, actually you know VC package binary cache or, or a port for those LLVM libraries that you can build once get it into a binary cache and then reuse it that that might be a way to go but it's hard to say from this distant perspective so overall not a bad idea tough problem difficult to solve and, and the tool is actively developed which is why you want to try and uh, get onto you know their latest version like I said they're the current they, they consider it alpha software and um, you know this is alpha quality software they're not claiming this thing is anywhere near perfect um, but it is actively developed um, you know 1500 commits you know the most recent commit was last week 
so they are working on it improving it all the time um, if you look through their release notes of the changes you can see that basically as they improve it over time what they do is they improve the mappings for GCC and Clang so that the standard library isn't reporting false positives trying to tell you to include private headers and they whittle away more on the edge cases of like funky template instantiations and type aliases and so on to get the results to be more and more accurate and it will improve over time and obviously it was considered useful enough that Clang went and added integration support for it um, if you look at Clang's integration support for these various static analyzers like CPP check and Clang tidy and so on um, it's probably just that they they already had the mechanism in place to glue in a static analyzer and they just add in a, another variable for include what you use so from the perspective of of CMake they probably you know it's not like they went to a great extent to do something special for include what you use they just took their existing static analyzer method and extended it a little bit more um, it's kind of sad that it was so difficult to try and get useful results on Windows and I, I was unable to get the Clang, sorry, the CMake integration to work properly. Again, could just be user error on my part. I uh, ran out of time. But, tough problem. A good effort at solving that problem for basic, uh, you know, things of you got this thing transitively when you should be including it directly or you're including this thing that doesn't define anything it's a good tool for analyzing those situations um, various IDEs are getting support for uh, recognizing unnecessary includes resharper has such a facility it's not entirely accurate resharper that is uh, it it also has problems it incorrectly reports certain required headers as not required um, at least in some of my projects but that's I think that's mostly because the the use of headers in those projects is kind of unorthodox it's not standard practice and if those headers were following standard practice then uh, those false positives would go away another thing that I did notice about include what you use when it reports results uh, it tends to just take all the includes and put them in one big list now Clang format is smart enough to recognize that you don't always have your includes in just one big linear list they're usually in clumps and Clang format for instance when it sorts includes it sorts them in distinct clumps based on the separating uh, blank lines between the clumps so it won't take your three clumps of includes and then put them all together into one big clump and sort that and the reason developers clump the includes in the first place is either to indicate you know layers of distance from my source code you know application includes versus standard library versus um, a third-party library and we also sometimes clump them because we know that they have dependency ordering constraints that require certain includes to appear first before others and so we put them in clumps separated by blank lines so that Clang format won't bring them together again and within each clump they're fine to be sorted but you can't you can't get rid of the clumping because then the ordering would be messed up and the the dependencies won't be uh, the strict ordering that's required for inclusion won't be honored and um, it seems that include what you use doesn't recognize that it just dumps everything into one big list and furthermore you may have um, a cultural norm that says I list my includes from closest to my application to in the order of closest at, to my application first and then farthest away last so that would mean this header transitive.h that is my application header it should be first in the list and then the standard library stuff comes later and include what you use has an assumption that standard library stuff should come first and application specific stuff should come should come second and I, I think that's 
a Google style uh, constraint or imposition that's showing up in the suggestions of the way include what you use is suggesting I edit my include list um, or, or it, you know this is the full enku list maybe it's just it's not for the purposes of copying pasting into your code it's just a the full list and it, it puts it in a canonical sort order or something perhaps like that uh, it's, it's not entirely clear to me um, so there you go um, bit of a rough ride on Windows or through uh, Clang integration I keep saying Clang when I mean to say CMake CMake integration However, I was able to coax it into functioning through a workflow. And that's fine by me because that's what I really wanted to do for my projects anyway, was to have it run in a workflow on GitHub and alert me when I created one of these violations. But it would be nice to be able to run it locally. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a wait, I think, until we get better Windows support for this tool. Somebody's going to have to volunteer some pull requests I think I don't think Google's gonna ever get around to it so there you go not so bad not the greatest either 